cafe. Anyway, hey, hey, here we go. Mike's Daily Podcast. Welcome to FFF episode 2574 because Mike Matthews likes to say numbers. Mike's Daily Podcast. That's the F- episode today. My name is Mike Matthews. Thanks for listening. Last podcast, it was really glistening because we were being rained on and there was lots of water everywhere. And then something happened and you must be aware because I'm about to tell you that I had a slight technological Mike's Daily Podcast Technological the glitch that created a small Mike's issue but only only at the end of the podcast podcast. where I was trying to play you some of the old Mike Matthews I mean, young Mike Matthews. Mike Matthews from 30 years ago. And uh, the way that my little mixer works, if you do something, if you change some of the settings just so, you will end up with a, a, what we call overmodulation. Overmodulation. And that's, uh, that's something that a lot of podcasters don't even know happens, but that's what happens sometimes. So I, I had a little bit of that. If you want to hear that, go back to the last podcast that was called Sticks. It was called Sticks, not because of the band, not S-T-Y-X, but Sticks as in S-T-I-C-K-S and Chopsticks, actually, because Rocky, who is sitting on my lap at the moment, all blissed out like cats do purring away he has a thing about laps as I've mentioned in previous podcasts we named a podcast lap as we lap around and tell you about that but yes so sticks he likes to steal chopsticks and he stole my lovely lady friend's chopsticks as she was trying to eat pho and that was phenomenal phenomenal and what we are doing now is the podcast picture and here's today's podcast picture thank you a frame it was yesterday after i did the podcast i went for a walk as the sun was setting and the clouds were looming over the bay area as they have done now for several days as we are now working on our 12th atmospheric river i took a picture of this interesting spot up above podcastro valley where we are now cafe anyway Somewhere in Podcastro Valley, the last place on earth. See that picture now at mikesdailypodcast.com. There is also a picture of Cafe Anyway. If you have not seen it, you should check it out. And of this guy right here, the late great Basil the Boxer. I went from a boxer to a cat. And there's some similarities. Some, believe it or not. They, uh, actually, the cat that I have now fetches and does a much better job fetching fetch that's so fetch why is mean girls getting so popular we got the mean girls uh, musical and people can seem to uh, relate to mean girls eons ago what was her name the the Lo- lindsay lindsay lohan and then amanda seafried who went on to other things and i think that's how you say her name and there, <laughs> there's the quotes from it. Oh, yes. And d- did you know that was a movie done by um, Saturday Night Live? Oh, f- the front panel will the- close automatically. Please remain. There is a science. Oh, the New York Post did a re- did a little study as to why Mean Girls are so popular. And this came from MSN.com and New York Post. Adriana Diaz There could be a reason Characters like Regina George From the film Mean Girls Are put on a pedestal by their peers A recent study found That both women And men prefer When their friends are vicious Towards their enemies It was in the journal Evolution and Human Behavior The study explained that The benefits of friendship depend in part on how much one's friends value oneself relative to others. And thus, 
that a friend's behavior toward others can influence one's own outcomes. Researchers at Oklahoma State University surveyed over 1,000 individuals in student and non-student communities in the U.S. and non-student communities in India to analyze what behaviors they prefer in a same-sex best friend. Participants were asked to rate how much they would like to see certain behaviors like kindness, trustworthiness, viciousness, indifference, exploitative behavior, similarity, physical proximity, familiarity, and impartiality in a conflict in a best friend from a scale of one to seven. People want friends who are kind and trustworthy to them, but vicious to their rivals. The results suggested that while people generally want friends to be kinder and more trustworthy, they sometimes prefer friends who are more vicious or at least indifferent towards their enemies. This revealed that many people prefer friends who are kind to them and strangers, but they'll forgive unkind behavior when the vitriol is directed at their adversaries. Some of the study done in India, I've been watching the television show called Good Karma Hospital. And it is distributed through Acorn TV. I think it was created by ITV. And it's an interesting show. It's a hospital that's working in a bad, let's say, less uh, well-to-do area of India. And it's actually shot in Sri Lanka. But they come up with some interesting issues that affects those parts of India. And... It's an interesting show. So we've been hooked to that, although sometimes it gets pretty gross. So, yes, pretty gross. And then when you watch it, you got to kind of just go, oh, that's not the real thing. That's a bizarre special effect. I'm not watching like a reality show that has to do with medicine, which I can't stand watching those type of shows. And now we're doing the incision. Uh Uh-uh, no. But when it's fake, you're kind of, oh, they used used a little bit of some kind of... Mold to make that look like a real human heart. How fantastic. Not mold as in the stuff that comes from a tree or grows in your basement or in the back of your fridge, but a mold, like a, like a mold, like they create with, uh, when you put stuff in it and it hardens and it creates a, uh, I want to say the word epoxy. Do they use epoxy with that? Anyway. Well, that study was rather okay, obvious. We could have figured that out on our own, but that study figured it out. It ends by saying, so go call your best friend and see how vicious they can get when talking about your ex or horrible boss and it could benefit your friendship and your health, according to science. The study that found that those who engaged in a type of communication throughout their day reported higher qualities of well-being and happiness, especially Tina Fey. Increased feelings of connection and decreased stress compared to those who ghosted their friends that day. Tina Fey created Mean Girls. Amy Poehler was in it as well, playing a mom. And she was playing a mom back in the early O's when that show, when that movie came out. And she was really, (laughs) I don't think she had become a mom yet. She had a couple kids with Will Arnett her former husband. I collect facts like this. I also find that other people do interesting things where they collect stuff that you would go, oh, why would you collect that? There should be a TV show, there probably is, called uh, Collections Spectacular Collectors. I don't know. But the number of responses that were given back to this particular magazine that comes from Costco, (laughs) people were submitting what they collected. And this is what Costco Connection found out. And yes, I need to go back to Costco. This is a slug, possibly also a plug for Costco, but I need to go back to Costco because I'm running low on tomato sauce and you just there are so many things you can make with canned tomato sauce oh Mike why don't you make your own oh why don't you jump in a time machine and give me more time have you seen the trailer for Timescape that looks like a fun 
movie that's been done a million times. That would be fun if you're a parent and you have kids. Lots of interesting special effects. I don't know. Who, it looks like it's done by some independent company. I don't know. But I just saw that trailer. And for some reason, YouTube also decided to show me the trailer to the new David Letterman movie where he, he goes with Bono and The Edge from U2 back to Ireland and they do some concerts. And you're like, wow, all these guys are old. But yeah, they're old. It's, well, we're all, we're all getting older. Hopefully. Or then, if we're not getting older, we're dead. Here's what one collector said. I collect vintage advertising representing businesses across America. I bought my first, a double cola sign, for $10 in 1994. The collection expanded to neon signs, oil cans, road maps, ice cream containers, original advertising illustration art, and more. Every time <laughs> a CVS pharmacist working on the cash register who's always upset, every item has a story and what it was used for, the business it was used at, or the memories that are represented. What keeps me going is you just never know what you're going to find next. Just when you think you have it all, a new piece will show up. Interesting person that lives in Illinois who probably has a huge house that costs like nothing. <sighs> and has all that extra room. While on vacation in the summer of 1996, Joel and Susan Bierce saw a Pez clown, a Pez clown display rack in a grocery store and convinced the store owner to sell it. The display with hundreds of Pez dispensers for their two sons. Our goal was to fill the spinner rack with new Pez as the company released new designs. And they accomplished that and so much more. Eating that much Pez, did they get the diabetes? I don't know. My husband, Brett, has been an antique phonograph collector for over 40 years. People love to do that. Collect phonographs, turntables, old records, vinyl. Vinyl seems to just attract people like refrigerator magnets on a refrigerator. Our home is filled with breathtaking... Maybe refrigerator magnets are going to start collecting next. Our home is filled with, and you know, there's a perfect place for all those refrigerator magnets. I don't know what it is, but it's someplace in your kitchen. Our home is filled with breathtaking examples of phonographs dating back to 1980, whoops, 1898. Some of the earliest Thomas Edison ever produced. We got started collecting in 1982 when we bought our first phonograph and it didn't run. Brett took it completely apart and got it to run perfectly. We started going to swap meets looking for another phonograph and another. Over the years, we have tracked down and purchased the rarest phonographs that we can find. Phonograph collectors from around the world began collecting, oh, began contact, contacting Brett. And he started a free YouTube channel to teach the next generation how to purchase, restore, and play these beautiful machines. Interesting. And then this person from Eto Eto Etobicoke, Ontario. I'm guessing. This person collects snails. Not the skinny ones found in ponds or forest floors, but snail stuff. Beginning in 1994 with a white porcelain snail planter. Elaine now collect, con, counts 200 plus snails throughout her home, including a toothbrush holder, earrings, a lamp, clocks, a snow globe, wind chime, wind up toys, and a boot scraper. Let's see. Shall we look at one more? Okay. Why not, Mike? It's your podcast. Go for it. I hear you thumbing through that Costco connection. Page 36. Uh, let's see. Page 36 says, While being house, while doing house cleaning during COVID-19. Wow. Somebody was bored. Don 
from Minnesota found some pictures from the 1950s when her grandfather ran gas stations in California and Nebraska and pictures of her parents as teenagers at their Minnesota station. Then things just started falling into my lap, she says. A relative had buildings packed with what I thought was cool stuff and I also helped an elderly friend clean out her house where I found old advertising, calendars, thermometers, a CVS cash register person that had been given out as promotional items. That was a Stefan reference if you didn't catch it. I try to only collect items from the gas stations that connect to our family's past. It has to fit in with the theme. I even have the bell you would drive over at full service stations. Remember that ding ding? It had the little air pump that you'd drive over and it would hit, make the bell happen. Collecting is the joy of finding an inexpensive abandoned vintage item that creates that connection for me. It's so fun finding a new interesting piece. Another person says that they inherited their matchbox collection when their brother passed away. Seeing this collection brought back so many memories of him running out to buy a new matchbox every time allowing allowance came across around for us kids. We would spend hours drawing on large paper pads an entire city that his cars could travel around. These are the matchbox cars. If you don't know what that is, I don't that's really before my time too, but Another person says, I've been collecting owls for over 50 years. Yeah, I had a friend that collected pigs. Like little, uh, not actual pigs, but anything that had a pig on it. Put a pig on it. Of course, you have your piggy banks, but little pig uh, dolls. And hey, Rocky, quit hitting my mic stand. I've been collecting owls for more than 50 years. I bought an antique mirrored lighted curio cabinet with three glass sides. Ooh, what a nice display. I also have a collection of owl mugs displayed on the dining room wall. I have ceramic owl cookie jars and spoon rests, dish towels, and even owl curtains in my kitchen. I have several framed embroidered owls displayed in my hallway and several paintings of owls that I made displayed throughout my house. I have a shower curtain and matching owl towels, owl towels in my guest bathroom. Another person said it was a biography of Harry Truman that kickstarted Farron Schultz's, that sounds slightly German, interest in collecting presidential memorabilia. It began with the searching of an autographed copy of Mr. Citizen by Harry Truman. And he's in Oregon. From there, my wife and I went after items related to each president we actually voted for. Then the march back in time, one president at a a time. Patience and focus persevered. And we now have a document letter or book signed by each person to hold the office to date. This took more than 25 years to complete. Amazing. And one more. Honey pots. Yes, this person says that they have made honey pots. Oh, that there have been honey pots made for centuries. And wherever honey is sold, honey pots can usually be found. Major potteries around the world have almost without exception produced a honey pot at some point in their history. This person's passion for collecting and learning about honeypots uncovered a lack of information leading him to create the European Honeypot Collector Society in 1998 there in England to share and develop knowledge on the subject with other collectors around the world. Eventually, Doyle is his name, was approached by a publisher to write a small book on the subject, which was published in 2009. In addition to finding them at antique shops, malls, markets, charity shops, Doyle says that he has a lot. Oh, he got a lot from Costco. Oh, yeah, this is a Costco magazine article. So there you go. Somebody said in Shelbyville, Illinois, In my pest control business, I found out that 
the mouse trap is the most patented item in the history of the U.S. with over 4,500 patents. Building a better mouse trap. You've heard that expression. There are so many variations, complex, whimsical, and even gruesome. It's fascinating to find the unusual ones. For me, collecting is really the thrill of the hunt. Finding that unicorn that fellow collectors don't have. I find them in antique auctions, online stores, and from pest control colleagues and fellow collectors. There are also social media groups of collectors that buy, sell, and trade traps. My collection started nine years ago with a bookshelf, then a curio cabinet. Always goes to the curio cabinet. Once they get a curio cabinet, then they're committed. Then a couple more, and I'm now looking to build a new display in my barn. Some of the YouTube channels that I like to watch particularly Odyssey Oddities, they go and they visit these people that start big projects like this, collecting things or creating things, doing like giant mosaics. And hey, here's the name of certain collectors. If you collect it, there's a name for it. If you collect teddy bears, that's called an Arctophilist. A brandophilist is someone who collects cigar wrappers. A coleopterist is someone who collects beetles. A dipterist collects flies. <laughs> yeah, they are pretty dippy if they do that. There's the phallerist who collects medals, badges, and pins. What's the name for someone who collects clocks? Oh, yeah, clocks are cool. They're called a horologist. Someone who collects banknotes is a notophilist. Someone who collects bird eggs is an oologist. There's several O's in that word. Someone who collects matchboxes and matchbooks is a philuminist. A flangonologist is someone who collects dolls. A scripophilist is someone who collects bonds and share certificates. Oh, this is me. Someone who collects beer coasters. <laughs> I've, got, I've got quite a collection outside a cafe anyway. You should stop by and see it. They're called a TG Stologist. T, or maybe that might be Tegastologist. Someone who collects subway tokens is a vectorist. And someone who collects flags is a vexillologist. Fantastic. Outside a cafe anyway, somewhere in Podcastro Valley, look who is here now. Right at this moment. <laughs> Hi, Mark. It's Benita the Rodeo Queen. How y'all doing? I like your cat. Why does he keep hitting the mic stand, Mark Matthews? I don't know. He's enjoying it, though. It's, it's his way of saying hello to everybody on the podcast. Look who else is here. And it's a disgruntled fiddle player Tell you what What? I want y'all to do that segment That you were talking about In the description for this podcast Mark Matthews Tell you what What? The thing you were In the description Yeah Is your cat still hitting the mic stand? He's he's enjoying that And stealing chopsticks simultaneously Yes we're gonna do The Mike Matthews New Tunes feud in a moment And one more person to say hi to Hello, Mark. I'm making a delicious root beer. How's it right now? Mm. Oh, that's really good. What's in that? There's some flying oranges, man. I don't even know if that's a word, but dolls? You said, isn't a flying oranges the doll collector? Yeah, okay. Don't steal my beer coasters. Root beer coasters. Oh, I cut you. Okay. Thank you, Brewmaster. All right, now for the segment, the Mike Matthews New Tunes Feud. These songs are going to duke it out. They're going to fight. I'm going to press this button over here. So hopefully I don't, I don't over-modulate like on the last podcast. I was over-modulating. Okay, now this show, this part of the show, I'm going to have for you, yes... A couple of songs that have been emailed to me. People email me constantly with their music. And I'll go to the most recent one. And that was someone 
by the name of Mar- Marivon. Hi, my- oh, no, Jill McKenna. Ooh, I knew someone named McKenna. I knew a Lori McKenna years ago. But there's like a, a gazillion people named Lori McKenna. My name is Jill McKenna. I am an artist by the name of Marivon. And I am so excited to announce the release of the debut album, None of This Is Mine. This truly eclectic album features 14 incredible musicians from around the world, creating a concept album that goes beyond genre and geography. Let's see. They have a link. And let's listen to Maralan. And I can I can listen. Oh, they give me a bunch of choices. Listen on Bandcamp. Why don't we try that? That's usually the easiest to play. None of this is mine is the name of this song. Let's sit. Just take me somewhere where we're laughing. Get me back to Washington. Oh, I better stop it. Oh, that's cute. Oh, very minimalistic. I was trying to adjust the volume on that as I was playing it. That did not work the way I wanted it to. Okay, so that's Maravon. Song number one. Song number two is Frankie Flowers. Hey, Mike, I feel like all those super vivid dreams occasionally that make us wake up in a cold sweat and breathe a sigh of relief once we realize it was all a figment of our imagination. Bad dream is the product of the feelings that follow when I wake up from an intense nightmare, questioning what's real and what is not. And they have a link for me. I can listen to... The Bad Dream song through the, all these different. I can go to Spotify, Title, which I don't have, Amazon Music. I don't think I have that. Let's try it on Spotify. Let's see. This might not work. Oh, by the way, I am on Spotify. Oh, it's, it's kind of start listening with a free. I already have an account. Why do they? Ugh. Well, here's a little tip to all of y'all. Oh, I can also play it here. Bad dream. A tip to you musicians that send me songs. Please don't... Make it, make it stick with the basics. Bandcamp. Don't don't give. Hey, you can hear my song on this thing, but you got to sign in for it. No, I don't have time. Put the song like right there on the email, please. Make it easy. Or YouTube. YouTube. I I don't have to sign in. It's easy. Okay. Oh, they did have a YouTube link, but it was all the way on the bottom. All right. So that was song number two. Song number three is by Leah Cole. And it is called The Ceiling Reposes. Curiosity for its own sake, this is at the heart of Leah Cole's work, which finds meaning where others might find none. Whether collaborating with some of independent music's biggest names like Steve Gunn, Whitney, Micaiah McCraven, improvising music around the world, or exploring intimacy with multimedia performance art, Cole builds webs of connections along paths less traveled. Okay, this is a song. Oh, they're showing me the whole album. They want me to pick a song from it. All right, let's see. This is called, we'll just pick the one at the top. This is In a Specific Room. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so that's what we got, everybody. I think we'll end it there. Even though there's a bazillion other one. All right. We'll do one more. Christian Turner. Uh, uh, hi, Mike. Don't you ever miss those good old days when you had no cares or responsibilities? 
Now that I'm in my 30s, it's getting harder to get all our friends together and just hang out. When we recorded Barely Listening, I was frustrated with the lyrics and completely scrapped them. I slept on it, then came back the next day with a new set of lyrics that I felt still captured the feeling of those growing pains through the original working title, Stuck. Okay, check out Barely Listening here. Please do not just limit me to sound, uh, Spotify. Thank you. Okay, here's a YouTube. I won't get so mad at you. No, I don't want to make a big plan. We can chill in my backyard. Barely listening to the name of that Christian Turner. And why I should have to cut him off is because I'm going to get dinged. I got dinged the last podcast because I was playing an air check of me 30 years ago. Actually, it was about 34 years ago. Yeah, 34 years ago. And I was playing a song in this last podcast that was called Sticks, where a song came up from Martika and not the famous one, Toy Soldiers. No, it was the one she released before that. I forget what it's called. But YouTube dinged me. They said copyright violation. And I don't even, I didn't even play that much of the song. So hopefully I don't get dinged by any of the other songs that I just played. Which were, just to remind you, song number one was by Maravan. Song number two was by Frankie Flowers. That was that bad dream one. Song number two was by Leah Cole. And song number three was, song number four, I think, was uh, by Christian Turner. Which one did you like? Which one out of all of those? Give me a call at 510-228-4640. 510-228-4640. If I missed any in the recap, I apologize but it's kind of messy out here at Cafe Anyway, where the rain is falling. It's off and on today, but we're going to get another atmospheric river tomorrow. Yikes. Wish me well, will ya? And more ways to wish me anything here to get in contact with me for the segment emails from email and your common not so comments. It is a frame. Mike's TV podcast is written and produced and performed by Mike Matthews. His podcast is super easy to find. Download or listen to his show and read his blog at mikesdailypodcast.com. Email Mike now at mikesdailypodcast at gmail.com. See you tomorrow. Bye.